Open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 11, if you'd be willing. And as you turn there, um, just wanted to let you know, two weeks from tomorrow, we're going to be celebrating some really um, wonderful baptisms. All of our baptisms are wonderful, but these will be particularly unique. Uh, Two weeks from tomorrow, we're actually going to have baptisms on a Sunday, and it's going to be our first destination baptism. We're actually going to the mountains for this, and everyone is invited. But two weeks from tomorrow, we're going to be meeting at Lost Lake, which is up in Nederland area, up above Boulder, about an hour and 45 minutes from Parker. And so if you'd like to join us in the drive up there, we'll be meeting at 10 o'clock on Sunday. Uh, I think there's information in your bulletins and on our email distribution list. But Matt and Danielle Kelly will be baptized in Lost Lake two weeks from tomorrow. They will also renew their vows, and they will also have their children dedicated. It's going to be a full sweep. So you're not going to want to miss it. Uh, come on up, bring a picnic lunch, uh, put on your hiking boots, it's about 2.7 miles round trip. Um, it's supposed to be a pretty easy hike, but you're going to get a Sunday hike in, you're going to get spiritual feast, you're going to get fellowship with your church family, it's going to be awesome. So I'm going to be there, hope you'll come too. Kids, our word of the day today is test. All right, you count how many times you, you hear me say the word test, which I think is very appropriate, being that you're going back to school, you know, it's just kind of getting you in that, that the mindset, looking for the tests. Count how many times you hear me say the word Put it on a piece of paper with your name on it, and take it to the back afterwards. We'll have something for you. And again, I don't know how you feel about tests being tested. Um, I know that if if, if you're getting ready to head back to school, probably tests are one of the things you dread, right? And and if if you're still able to remember school, tests are probably things you remember dreading. Tests aren't some of our favorite things. A lot of us don't like tests. We say we don't do well with tests, but... You know, tests aren't something that are just in the realm of school or academics, but tests are a part of relationships. Tests are a part of life. Uh, but although we are constantly being tested, we really don't like the sound of that. You know, if you were just getting to know somebody and they said to you, I'm watching you and I'm testing you because I want to see what you're made of. I want to see whether you will be a worthy friend to me. That would kind of rub you wrong, I would imagine. Because we don't like the idea of being tested. It it gives us the idea of someone sitting in judgment over us. You know, maybe like trying to see whether we're good or bad, and and maybe even manipulating circumstances and trying to paint us into the corner to, to see how we'll respond. We don't like the idea of being tested because also with testing comes this, this idea that the person testing us wants us to fail for some reason. That the odds are stacked against us so that there are more chances to fail than there are to actually pass the test. But here's the thing. While you may not like that friend saying that to you, I'm testing you to see whether you're trustworthy, that's exactly what's happening. And if we're really honest with ourselves, we are all testing one another all the time. Whether we say it, or whether we acknowledge it, or whether it's even a conscious in our brains, we are always testing one another. Parents test their kids all the time, right? I mean, we, we put our kids into certain circumstances, and we wait and see how they will respond. We give them a little bit of money. We see what they'll do with a little bit of money. We, we put them with these kind of uh, people, or these kid, other kids, and we wait and see how they will uh, interact with the other kids. But we, we put our kids in certain circumstances and we wait and see how they respond and, and hopefully, we hope they pass the test. We want them to. We want them to do good. But at the times when they maybe don't do, do so good with the test and we see, oh, that's an area that is an area for growth and we're able to say, hey, we're going to like, work with, with Johnny on that and, and hopefully he'll be able to grow through and next time do better. New couples test each other all the time. Come on. Ladies, you're on a first date with a guy. Do you not slow down a little bit before you get to the door to see whether he's going to open the door for you or not? (laughs) Do you not wait and see whether he is going to pick up the check or not? You want to see what kind of guy it is. And then the tests go on from there. Right? We know that. (laughs) Guys. I don't know. How do guys test girls? I don't know. Maybe maybe you just float it out there that you're still living with your parents and just see how she responds to that, or I don't know. Or you get sick and you want to see if she nurses you back to health. You want to see if she's as good as your mother. You know, you're testing people all of the time. You don't say it, but I bet you do it. In-laws do it. New friends do it. 
Kids do it to their parents all the time. Kids are always testing their parents. Where are the boundaries? How far can I go? When will they say no? Will they really follow through with that? I want to see. I'm going to push the boundaries. I'm going to test them. I want to know. Uh, employers do it. I was talking with a friend this week. She said she was in the middle of just this busy day, and she got a call from a, a job interviewer uh, and said, hey, can we talk right now, do an interview over the phone? And she said, I think they were testing me to see whether I was flexible or not. So I thought I had to take the call, even though it was a really rotten time. But, I mean, new employers do that with, with new employees all the time. Test them. See what kind of person they are. The point is, relationships develop through testing. Um, and we learn what the other person is made of, whether they're dependable, whether they're trustworthy, whether they're faithful, honest, generous, thoughtful, whatever. And the fact is, it's no different for God. Today, as we continue our series on Moses, we're going to see that God will test the Israelites. And that's not a bad thing. I mean, God didn't skew the circumstances against the Israelites so that they, were fa- they would fail. As a matter of fact, God was pulling for them to pass. He did everything in His power so that they would pass this test. And some did pass. Most actually did. But others failed. But what we're going to see is that the tests were intended for the people not just to see what they were made of, but to demonstrate to them what God was made of. Okay, if you get nothing else today, I hope you get that. That when God tests us, it is number one, show what we're made of, and number two, give Him an opportunity to demonstrate to us what He's made of. Now, if you were with us last week, we studied the story of the parting of the Red Sea and and how God will often lead us into tight places. And and today's message in many ways is is very similar to last week's. And you're going to see similarities. But I think that this message needs to be said again for one reason because it is just the, the theme throughout the story of God developing relationship with the Israelites. Again and again, it came down to these same situations. What will they do when they're in a tight place? How will they respond when God puts them in a testing situation? And it's also important because last week I realized how relevant this topic is. I can't tell you how many people I heard from who said, that is exactly what I'm going through. That's what I needed to hear. That was a great reminder. You know, this is is our our life. And and really it is. It is not only our life, but this is how relationships with God are developed. We want to know, how do I develop a personal relationship with God. The relationship of intimacy and depth. The kind of relationship that will stand the test of time. And until we figure this stuff out, how we respond to the tight places of our lives, what we will do when God is perhaps testing us, until we figure these things out, we will never fully develop that relationship, lasting relationship of intimacy with God that I think we are all hungry for. And so God tested the Hebrews to show what is in their hearts and to teach them what is in his. Let's pick up the story where we left off last week. Exodus, well, it's not where we left off last week, but we're going to pick up in Exodus chapter 16, verse 1. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin. Now, that is not a metaphorical desert of sin. It doesn't mean that they were sinful there. It's just the name of it. It comes from the word Sinai. So it's the desert of sin, better pronounced Zin, actually, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. All right, so does does the scene seem uh, somewhat familiar to anybody? Uh, If you were with us last week, the scene is incredibly familiar because this is the same thing that happened as the Israelites were trapped between the Egyptian army and the Red Sea. And and, and they're here in another uh, difficult situation. They're going to respond the same way. They're going to show their true colors. You know, it's been now a month and a half since they've left Egypt. And the novelty of being free and the novelty of living off the land has worn off. If any of you have camped for more than a few days, you know what that's like, right? It's like, okay, novelty's over. And the Israelites, they're tired, they're hungry, they're thirsty. 
they, they don't know where they're going to get food. And so what do they do? Well, they came out and they grumbled against Moses and Aaron and they complained and they reminded Moses of how great things had been back in Egypt, how we had the all-you-can-eat buffet every day, everything we wanted, it was just there, it was so awesome. Don't you remember, Moses? And now you've brought us here to the desert to die of hunger. Now, no doubt about it, these people were in a tight place. They, they needed food. Um, they were... Um, again, in that tight place, and that tight place was revealing what was in their heart. It was revealing their character. But if we put ourselves in their place, um, we can certainly understand their concern. I mean, they were hungry. And a lot of us don't know the kind of hunger that they probably experienced. And, and even when we do experience hunger, we've got a Taco Bell or we've got a, a King Supers that we could run to to, to to grab a bite to eat, you know, until our next meal or whatever. But these parents, they didn't have little baggies of goldfish to, to feed their kids, you know, before lunch. They had no idea where food was coming from. And that's a scary place to be. But after everything that God had done for them through the plagues in Egypt, through the parting of the Red Sea, the destruction of the Egyptian army, and other things, you would have thought that now in this desperate time of need, they would have been able to respond a bit differently. You know, at least they could have like called a prayer meeting. Let's get together and let's pray about it. Or they, they could have gone to Moses and they could have said, hey, how is God going to get us out of this one? We want to see this. The Red Sea was cool. What is he going to do now? I mean, they could have responded with faith, but they didn't. They cried out and they grumbled against Moses and ultimately they grumbled against God. Yet despite their whining, despite their grumbling, despite their complaining, we're going to see that God will graciously provide for them. Now, there is a common myth that there is no grace in the Old Testament. That all the goodness and grace of God is in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament, God is just this grumpy old God who loves like hurting people. Now, I don't buy into that myth. I think that there is so much grace in the Old Testament. And this is just one of those places. God provides for whiners. Isn't that good news? Is that not grace? If I were God, they would not be eating until they could clean up their act and get a good attitude and come to me with gratitude for everything I've already done for them. But God doesn't scold them. He doesn't rebuke them. He just, you know, ah, I'm going to provide for you. Because that's who God is. God is a God of grace. He provides for whiners, and that is good news for us. Can I get an Amen. God provides for whiners. All right. And in his provision of their need, he's going to test them to see what is in their heart. He's not going to test them, and then if they pass the test, then give them the food. No, he's going to test them through feeding them. And he's going to do this through two very interesting miracles. Let's look at verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see what they, whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So God is going to provide for the people. He's going to rain down bread from heaven, and in so doing, he says he's going to test them. Verse 5 says, In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. Again, we don't like the idea of being tested. Now, again, if someone came to us and said, I'm testing you, we would not respond well to that. But while we don't like the idea of being tested, this sounds like the kind of testing that normally happens in the beginning of relationships. I want to see what the kind of person this is. I want to see whether they'll listen to me. I want to see whether they're, you know, dependable or not dependable, or rebellious or easy to get along with. He wants to know what's in their hearts as they develop this relationship. Now, of course... Can we just state the obvious? God knew it was in their hearts, right? God didn't need to test them and say, oh, huh, I thought he would do better. No, God knew what was in their hearts. And so when God tests us, it's not for his sake. But God will test us in order to expose what is in our hearts for our sakes. Because there is stuff in us that we don't know about. And it doesn't come out, out until we are in a tough place. And all of a sudden we get in a tough place. We're like, ooh, 
I didn't know that was still in there. But then that gives us the opportunity to take that and to give it back to God and say, God, could you please deal with this? Can you make me whole in this area? Could you please transform me in this area of weakness, in my character, in my life, in my heart? And so in this testing, God is exposing the people's hearts for their sake, not his. And you can see he is not skewing the circumstances against the people of Israel. He's not hoping that anybody's going to fail. He's providing for their needs. And then he's going to tell them, this is exactly what you need to do in order to pass the test. You need no superhuman strength. You need no special skill. All you need is enough faith to do what I tell you to do. Okay, I'm going to tell you exactly what to do. Okay, you don't even need faith to do these things. It, I mean, just, just do these things and you will pass the test. And the test is two miracles to see what's in their hearts and whether they're going to follow instructions. But more than seeing whether they'll follow instructions, God is using these tests to show them what's in his heart. Let's learn more about this first test and see um, what it tells us about the Israelites and about God. Verse 13. That evening, quail came and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It's the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Each one is to gather as much as he needs. Take an omer, or about two liters, just imagine a two liter bottle of soda, uh, full of this stuff. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. Wow. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it by the omer, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. Each one gathered as much as he needed. Then Moses said to them, No one is to keep any of it until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning. But it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. This first test that God gives the people was the daily provision of of manna. And as we just read, every day there would be this thin layer after the dew had dried on the ground and the people were instructed to go out and to, to gather this manna and to, to form it into cakes and, and to bake it. And this would be their bread. But they could only gather enough just for that one day. They couldn't gather three days worth or a week's worth and, and store it away and hoard it. Part of the test was God wanted to put the people in a tight spot every day. You see that? He wanted to grow their trust and their dependence on him every day. And one thing was becoming clear about the Hebrews. No matter what God did for them, no matter what the miracle was, no matter how he provided for them, they did not have confidence that God would provide for them again. Like a lot of us. God has provided for us so many times in the past, but this new problem, I don't know if God's going to help me this time, right? And so this is the same for the Hebrews. They, they did not have that confidence about the future. And so they, they, they had these short memories. And so God provides a test that would not only test them, but teach them. They couldn't store it up. They couldn't hoard it. They could only gather enough for today. Tomorrow, they would have to trust God to provide for them again. It was as if God is saying, I want you to have a daily dependence on me. Would you please show me that you trust me enough to just gather enough for today and trust me that I'm going to bring more manna out tomorrow? Could you trust me that much? Don't store it up overnight. I'll take care of you again tomorrow. And here God is dealing with their fear, a fear that we can all relate to, a fear of not having enough. These people were afraid that they wouldn't have something to eat tomorrow. And so some of them stored it up overnight. And he's trying to turn their fear into faith through the teaching of the manna. So I'm wondering, what are the fears that you have about the things you need in your life? Do you have fear around your income? Maybe you're going to lose it. Maybe you're not going to have enough. Make, you're not going to make enough to sustain your lifestyle. Maybe you're concerned about retirement. 
that you won't save enough to sustain your lifestyle? Uh, maybe you're concerned about job security. Will I be able to keep my job? Maybe some of you are concerned about, will I even get a job? Are, are, are you worried about transportation or clothes? Do you have fear about food, about adequate shelter? And I think if we're all honest, we would probably all say that we don't have the same problems that the Hebrews did. Right? doesn't mean we don't have real issues. doesn't mean we have really serious problems that we have to deal with, because I know right here in this room right now, there are some really heavy, there's heavy, heavy uh, issues that we're carrying, things that make us worry and give us fear. But we don't seem to have the same problems and issues as the Hebrews had. I mean, for the most part, most of us have full pantries. We have uh, 401ks. Many of us have savings accounts. And we don't have to depend on God to feed us daily. We get to the part of the Lord's Prayer where Jesus teaches us to pray, give us this day our daily bread, and that just kind of confuses us. Well, why would I need to pray that? I know where my daily bread is coming from. It's right there in the refrigerator. It's in the pantry. It's in my wallet. I don't need God to provide my daily bread. Why would I need to trust God for food today? So rather than worry about what we'll eat today, many of us wonder whether the resources we have will just last until we die. That's what we worry about. Well, what I have today and what I'll make in the next few years will last the rest of my life. And that doesn't put us in the kind of place where we have to trust God for much of anything. And God knows that we normally won't trust Him unless we have to trust Him. Have you noticed this in your life? I mean, we may say we trust God, but we're not really trusting Him for anything. And if God vanished from my life, my lifestyle would continue as it is right now. God knows that we won't trust Him unless we have to trust Him. He knows that need is the greatest incubator of faith, that having little to nothing stimulates dependence on Him for what I have. And that's why so many of us, we go on these mission trips, and when we go to the poorest of the poor countries in the world, and we get to know these people, and we talk to them, people in Peru and Rwanda and Nepal, these people who really have to pray, God, give us today our daily bread, because when they wake up, they don't know where their meal is coming from. They are trusting God, and they have seen God continually provide day in and day out, and they acknowledge Him and they thank Him. And we wonder, how do these people who have nothing have so much faith? But they live in an incubator for faith, where they have to trust God for everything that they have. And what God is teaching us through this test of the Israelites is that the less we have, the more faith we need. Your need is a test that God will use to show you what's in your heart. Will you have faith when you have need? And so in a land of plenty, God will often create need in your life, to teach you not only what you're made of, but also to show you what He's made of, and that He is a provider. What need do you have right now? I'm not talking about what want, although we have such a gracious God, He usually even takes care of those. But what need do you have? Could your current need be a test from God? Not only showing you what's in your heart, but more importantly, teaching you what's in his. Could he be testing you to see where you'll turn for the provision of your need? To yourself or to him? And, and if so, how might you respond in the midst of that test? Well, for the Israelites, most of them, it seems, passed the test. And some didn't. Some just gathered enough for that day and didn't try to, try to store more. They trusted God to provide more tomorrow. But some of them, uh, not trusting God to provide for their needs, gathered more than they needed. They hoarded. They stored up some for tomorrow, more than God said to. But regardless of whether they passed the test or they failed the test, God was teaching them what was in His heart. He was providing for them. He was feeding them from his hand every morning in miraculous ways. He's taking care of their needs despite their grumbling, despite their complaining. 
And again, I say, what incredible grace. And I believe he wants to just reveal his heart to every one of us in similar ways. When we get back into the corner and we have need that we would look up and that we could see what he is made of as he comes through and he provides for us as a father provides for his children. The second part of the test came in the Sabbath miracle. Exodus chapter 16, verse 22. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much, two omers for each person. And the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses. He said to them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. Save whatever is left and keep it till morning. So they saved it until morning, as Moses commanded. And it did not stink or get maggots in it. Eat it today, Moses said, because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. You will not find any of it on the ground today. Six days you are to gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will not be any. Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, but they found none. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my instructions? Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is why on the sixth day he gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where he is on that seventh day. No one is to go out. So the people rested on the seventh day. So here's God's second test, and it comes to the second miracle uh, the Sabbath miracle. And the miracle is really twofold. Uh, first of all, there would be no manna on the seventh day. I mean, six days of the week, there was manna on the ground. Seventh day, there wasn't. That seems pretty strange. Every seventh day, no manna. Pretty miraculous. And the second part of the miracle is that the stuff kept over from the sixth day into the seventh didn't get smelly and maggoty. Any other day you tried it, it would get smelly and maggoty. This day, it didn't. Again, a miracle. And here he is testing what's in their heart. Um, whether they would listen to him or not. The first test was kind of about, will you trust me to provide for you? And this one is, will you do what I ask you to do? He's testing what's in their hearts. Would they do what it, he asked them to do? And, and most did, most would. Most would gather twice as much on the sixth day in order to keep it over until the seventh. Every, you know, it's like God saying, hey, I want you to be able to you know, sleep in tomorrow. Take it easy. And most people are like, sign me up for that. I mean, that's a no-brainer. But according to verse 27, some of the people went out on the seventh day. And it just seems that from history and in my experience that there are always some of the people bunch still around today. Some of the people who would stand against uh, Moses no matter what he says. Some of the people who would stand against God too for that matter. I'm not doing that. That's just stupid. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Why would I do that? I mean, why would I store up twice as much? And, and they, they really had their reasons. I mean, they could have given you logical reasons as to why they were disobeying God. In this, it would have made sense. First of all, they said, especially this group, the some of the people group, the rebellious people amongst the, the Hebrews, they've already tried storing it up overnight, and they saw what happened there. Even though they were told not to, they stored the manna overnight, it got stinky and maggoty. So they're thinking, why would I do that now? I'll just go out and get more tomorrow. But there wasn't any tomorrow. That's one reason they would probably disobey. Another reason they would disobey is because, you have to remember, their whole identity was that of a slave. That's all they had ever done. was They've been slaves in Egypt, and so it's just activity. Do, do, do. Work, work, work. It's who they were. So now God says, I want you to take a day off. I want you to do nothing. I want you to rest. I want you to be with me, in relationship with me. Don't worry about gathering food. I'll give you twice as much on Friday. You'll have plenty. We'll, we'll, we'll preserve it miraculously. Don't worry. I got that covered. Just rest. And, and the people were like, well... If I'm not working, uh, what will I do? That sounds like that might be boring. Um, I just don't know if I could do that. So this would be a very difficult commandment to follow when seen from a, a human perspective. And that, though, was the test. Would they be willing to do what God told them to do even when it didn't necessarily make sense? Will you do what I ask you to do and let me be your God? is what I believe God was saying. And most did, but some didn't. And in this test, he was not only exposing what was in the hearts of, of some of the people, all of the people really, but he was exposing what was in his own heart as well. He was providing food so that they didn't have to work. 
He was providing food that showed that they could trust him each day. And then one day a week, he said, I want to even provide a day off for you. I know how horrible of him, right? But God is teaching them what's in his heart. He's saying, I'm a God about relationship. I want to be in relationship with you. If you're working every day, I just want to take a whole day where it's just, you know, us, working on us. A God who tells them their identity isn't in doing. They are no longer slaves in Egypt. They are now children of God, children of Yahweh. And so once a week, God says, stop and focus on your relationship with me. Would you do that? And friends, God tests us today in such similar ways. To see what is in our hearts, but to also show us what's in his heart. The seventh day Sabbath is a perfect example that is pretty obvious from this story. The seventh day Sabbath doesn't necessarily make sense, right? As we look at the seventh day and compared to the or the seventh day and compared to the first day or the fourth day, they all seem alike to us. So there's nothing that really makes one stand out against the other. The only thing that makes the seventh day seem any different is the fact that God said it was different. It's only his word that makes it different. Just like it was uh, the Sabbath with, with the manna. And so God says it's a holy day. He says it's a day to do no work, but to rest in him, to stop doing and buying and selling and working. And it seems unthinkable to us because that's our identity. But like those tests the Israelites went through in the desert, The Sabbath reveals what's in our hearts. Can I be still for 24 hours and relate with God and others? Can I worship? Do I have a spiritual appetite? Am I willing to slow down and connect with others? Am I willing to serve? Am I willing to show mercy? And, And in this test, we also find a revelation of what's in God's heart. The Sabbath tells us what's in God's heart. I mean, a God whose primary concern isn't that we work for Him, but that we be in relationship with Him. That's pretty significant. That's like the only God ever known who's like that. A God who wants to give us rest. A God who knows what we need more than we do. A God who is concerned about your physical and emotional and spiritual well-being and knows you need a rhythm in your week and you need one day off every seventh day to be with Him. I mean, there is a reason. We begin worship at 11.15 and not 7.15 in the morning. That's because God wants you to have a day to sleep in at least one day a week. Is he not a good God? And then he wants you to go to church after you sleep in. But he is a good God. That's why he's a good God. But another example of a test God gives us that shows what's in our heart and teaches us what's in his, his is tithe. Think about this. God asks us to return 10% to him of our income. And in a sense, through this command, he is creating need in my life. He is asking us us to live on 90% of what we make rather than 100%. And that's really a test of faith for a lot of us. I mean, it's a test of faith that shows what's in our hearts. Do we acknowledge where that income comes from, from God, or do I really believe it comes from me? And the tithe is not only a test of my heart, but it's also a test of God's heart. One of the strongest passages in the Bible about the tithe, you know, is Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, where God is telling people, encouraging them to tithe, and then he says, test me in this. You return your tithe to me and test me and see if I don't throw out the blessings of heaven on your life. The only place in the Bible where God says, test me. So here's God putting us through a test, and in the midst of the test, he's saying, test me because I want to expose my heart to you. I want, I want you to give me an opportunity to show myself to be faithful to you, to be compassionate to you, to be a, a providing father to you. And when we test him in, in the tithe, he will, on a weekly and on a monthly basis, show how powerful, show how good, show how real he is, show how much he wants to be involved in our lives. The tests in our lives not only expose what's in us, it exposes what's in God's heart. So, How might you be being tested in your life right now? Again, God will create need in your life to see what you're made of. He's not stacking the odds against you so you fail. He is pulling for you. He is providing everything you need so that you can succeed. All he does is say, look to me. Trust me. Wait for me. Let me show you my heart 
through this need that you have right now. God will also give us instructions and commands that are good for us to see whether we will follow his instructions. And again, those things will expose what are in our hearts. But at the same time, they'll also expose his goodness because God never asks us anything to do but that doesn't bless us and doesn't give us more eternal happiness rather than less. But here's the thing. In all these tests, what God is showing he wants with you is relationship. Could you be in the middle of a test right now? And could God be testing you, not just to see what's in your heart, because he's pulling you into a relationship so you could see what's in his. I remember one of the first real tests I came to in my faith journey. I'd been a Christian for about a year, um, not even probably, and um, I was convicted on the Sabbath. And it wasn't a hard thing for me because at the time I was a stockbroker and I worked when the stock market was open, you know, great hours, 7.30 to 2, Monday through Friday. Never had a Sabbath conflict. But as I was on this journey for several months, all of a sudden there was something on my calendar that was looming that kind of caught me off guard. And uh, once a year, our firm, uh, we had to get together for an annual compliance meeting. It was an all-day meeting where the entire firm, all the brokers came from around the country. We had to sit in a room all day and learn the newest SEC laws that regulated our industry. It was very boring, but it was mandatory. It was by law, we had to be there. And the firm always had that meeting on Saturday. Well, all of a sudden, like, wow, my first real crisis of faith. What am I going to do here? Do I really believe that God wants me to kind of not work on the Sabbath? Or, or, you know, do I believe that my employer's boss? Or, you know, what, what's up with that? And to add to that, um, anyone who missed the annual compliance meeting w- was fined $1,000. Now, this was in 1993 when $1,000 was still a lot of money. Okay? <laughs> so... And we were young, and we're like, man, $1,000, that's going to hurt. Oh, man. And so I grappled with this decision. What am I going to do? Am I going to go to this meeting and save $1,000 and just ask for forgiveness? Or am I going to, like, uh, you know, stand according to my convictions and lose the $1,000? And I, I, I talked with people in my church, and they prayed for me. And I can't believe how hard this was for me. You know, I'm ashamed to say this was a very difficult decision. But in the end, I decided, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go to the meeting. I'll lose $1,000. I told the president of our firm, hey, I'm not going to be there. I'm so sorry. You know, take it out of my check. But um, I just have this conviction. I can't, I can't be there. Um, two days later, a memo came out. And the president of the firm said, uh, for financial reasons, we are moving the day of the annual compliance meeting, which for the life of our firm has been on Saturday. We're moving it to Thursday. And this had nothing to do with my decision, he said that, oh, just the finances worked out. We were able to save a lot of money doing it on Thursday. So, hey, you're off the hook. I was so glad. <laughs> I was so glad I passed that test because not only, and, and I'm not saying that I was a hero through that. I, I had to struggle through that. And I'm ashamed to say, I mean, that I, I would have thought of disobeying God for $1,000. But through that, I was able to see the provision of God I never would have been able to see had I not said yes to him. He showed me when I was young in the faith through that experience that I'm involved in your life. That I'm not some distant God who doesn't care. But I want to be involved every day and I will take care of your need regardless of what it is. You trust me and I'll provide for you. And so again I ask you, how are you doing? What might happen in your life if you began to trust God in the midst of your need even though you don't know what the future holds? What might happen if you began to obey God even when it doesn't make sense, how could your life look different? And I just want to close by speaking to two uh, groups of people who are, are with us today. And the first group are those who are kind of young in the faith, or maybe you haven't even made a decision to accept Christ yet. You're not sure whether you trust Jesus um, to, to kind of fully surrender your life. And others of you, you, you're just starting off on your faith journey, but you're still not so sure you like, like the idea of being tested. And so to you, I would say, would you just be willing to pray? You know what? I'm not sure, God, I want you to test me. <laughs> but when you do, because I know it's probably inevitable, because this is what happens when relationships are developed, when you do, would you give me strength to respond in a way that would not only please you, but that would reveal you to me so that I can know you more? Could you pray that prayer? Not, not, not test me, God, but God, when you do, give me strength to pass. 
And then I want to speak to another group of you, those of you who have been walking with God a little longer, and you've been tested, and you've failed some of those tests, and you're able to look back and see when you did, but you surrender those parts of your heart to God, and He is making you wholer, and He is filling you with His Spirit. And you're not perfect. You still have a long way to go. We all, we all do. But you've come to the place where you trust God enough that you would say to Him, bring it on. Test me. Because God, I know that when you test me, not only will you expose the parts of my heart that I need to see so I could ex- give those back to you so I can grow even more, but I know that when you test me, good things happen because you reveal your goodness to me through those tests. Could you, would you be willing to pray one of those two prayers? You know, not, I mean, not everyone has to pray. Bring it on. Okay, I understand. It's a scary prayer to pray. It's going to take some, some faith to pray, but I, I know some of you are there, and you could pray that prayer, but I want to be a part of a church that's willing to be tested by God because we know how good he is. And we know that the more we go through together, the more he reveals himself and the more he provides. I want to be a part of a spiritual community who's able to say together, you know, we've learned enough about God. He would never ask us to do anything that's not good for us. And whatever he asks, the answer is yes because he's shown himself to be faithful. I don't know about you, but let's pray for that right now.